Hi everyone, this is the exam review for chapters four, five, and six. Um, and uh, when you're approaching this, um, the things on the study guide that I'm gonna point out are the things that I get the most questions about. Um, one of those is social referencing. Um, when children engage in social referencing, um, one example of it is pointing. If you point at something, that other person is gonna look at that too. So you two have a connection and you're both looking at the same thing. Um, children, when they fall down sometimes, and you know this, um, they'll fall down and they'll look up at their caregiver to see whether or not it's something drastic. Um, and if the caregiver is surprised or horrified, then the child will start crying. Um, or if somebody walks into the room, somebody that they don't know, they'll look up at their caregiver um, to find out how they should react. Is this a friendly person? Um, is my caregiver, is my parent um, afraid? And if so, then I'm afraid as well. So that's social referencing and the importance of it. Um, this chapter also talks about attachment and um, uh, uh, temperament. Um, and there's a relationship between those two, and we've talked about that in the class um, earlier this semester. Um, the attachment patterns are usually measured using the strange situation. Um, and remember that it's not the crying when the child um, is left alone in the room or left alone with a stranger that we're measuring. We're measuring that reunion behavior because um, because of the, still, the strange situation, we're trying to stress the children. Not we, I don't do it, but um, in that research paradigm, they're trying to stress the child and then see how they will react um, at the renewed presence of their uh, primary caregiver. Um, and if the child is comforted when the person comes back, then that's a secure attachment. Um, but if they're not comforted, or then they have uh, one of two patterns. Well, there's a third one that's more disorganized, but um, the two primary um, alternative patterns for an insecure attachment, one is avoidant, um, and they just sort of look away. They're not, um, they're not upset, like they just sort of disengage, um, and that's an insecure pattern. Um, the other one is ambivalent. <clears throat> and when you think about ambidextrous, using both hands, Ambivalent is the presence of both emotions. Valence means whether or not an emotion is positive or negative. So ambivalent means it's the presence of both positive and negative emotions. So um, the child will approach the caregiver and want to be picked up. And then once they're picked up, they want to be put down. They both want that comfort and they want to push away from it at the same time. Um, so, um, and then uh, lastly in that, uh, in that chapter, um, talks about the development of emotions. And just keep in mind that emotions like pride and shame are more complex emotions. They're not the primary emotions of things like fear or sadness or joy or even interest. Um, it's the idea that the, the child, in order to experience shame, you have to know that there was something that you did that was wrong and that somebody else noticed it. Um, because if it's just you, then it's regret or sorrow. Um, but if it's, if it's regret or sorrow and you know that somebody else either witnessed it or could have witnessed it, that's when uh, shame arises. So you can see that that's more complex, it requires more complex thinking, um, and so it develops later um, in uh, infancy and early childhood. Okay. Um, for chapter five, um, chapter five talks about um, impulse control. Um, and um, uh, they bring up the idea of perseveration. Um, children have a hard time with emotion regulation. If you have a classroom full of preschoolers or kindergartners um, and they're working in centers and having fun, um, they tend to perseverate. They wanna keep doing that thing. It's very hard for them to draw back and say, okay, I'm gonna stop doing this really fun thing and I'm gonna put those things away and then I'm gonna go do this other thing that may or may not be fun. Um, and so um, effortful control and impulse control and emotion regulation, those are all things that are arising at this time. Um, by the way, um, back on chapter four, um, remember that temperament is an early precursor to personality and that it's biologically based. It's not biologically determined. Um, the environment does have an influence on temperament, um, but it, there's a strong biological component there, um, which will eventually turn into that person's personality. But since personality in the adult is a stable, is defined as a stable way of, um, uh, of acting across situations, um, you know, it's not identical, but it's relatively stable. Um, you don't get that stability until adolescence and adulthood. And so we don't talk about small children as having a personality. We talk about having them, uh, them having a temperament. Okay, back to chapter five. Um, uh, the Vygotsky uh, references in chapter five talk about the zone of proximal development. And that's that um, learning zone. It's hypothetical, but it's that learning zone where the child is challenged, can't quite do it by themselves, um, but can do it with a little bit of assistance. Um, the assistance is referred to as, as scaffolding. You might be providing things or measuring things for the child if they're um, making things or, or creating, a, you know, uh, creating a recipe or, or cooking something. Um, so you might help with those things. You provide scaffolding, which is temporary support until the child can do it themselves. Um, and in the process of doing that, what you are doing is providing guided participation. 
you're participating as a guide and helping that child, mentoring that child um, so that they can do it on their own and then they can, once they are an independent learner in that, whatever that domain is, um, then they can go on and progress within their zone of proximal development. If something is too hard for them, they're completely overwhelmed and can't make any progress. And if it's too easy for them, um, they're bored. And um, even if they keep doing it, they're not really learning anything. So Vygotsky, um, very influential in the field of educational psychology, um, what is the best way for children to learn um, where they can you know, gain the most ground um, and be the most um, successful. Um, children have a theory of mind or developed theory of mind at this time. Um, they start to understand that they might know something and somebody else might not know it. And so um, prior to this, they're not very good liars. Um, and then they start to realize that they can fool people or that they, can, um, that they might have to explain something to somebody that if they saw it, the other person didn't see it as well. Um, and so it's just a more complex way of thinking. And, and as we see these developments, we see that the child is growing um, and changing um, cognitively over time. Another change that we see is they start to make grammar errors that they weren't making before, and that's because their language is getting more complex. They are um, starting to form longer sentences. They're understanding and internalizing the rules of grammar. Um, so they hear things, and they hear things like um, you add S to something to make a plural, or you add ED to something to make it past tense. Um, and then they over-apply the rule. They, they learn the rule, they apply it to everything, and then they get corrected um, and they learn those um, corrections um, so that those early mistakes are a sign that they've learned the rule and they're just over-applying it. So it's actually a sign of cognitive growth and not, um, even though they're making more mistakes than they made before, they're making more mistakes because they're trying more complex things. Um, and lastly, in, this, in the study guide for, uh, for chapter five, um, the strategies that uh, help children with their reading skills, um, it's on page, I think, 187 in the book, um, and it talks about things like um, a code-based approach to learning reading. Um, it's better than using flashcards and, and trying to do whole words. There's been a lot of research on, uh, on how to teach children to read, and the code-based approach um, is very, uh, very helpful, you know, and it's the one that, uh, that works better and works better in the long term than uh, flashcards and, and whole language. Um, so the code-based approach, uh, phonics, having them decode things, um, parent education, you know, because you're in college, because you are educated, the, your children and the children around you uh, will hear you talk, they'll see you do things. Parent education has a big influence on children. Um, reading to children, you know, no surprise there. Um, it gets them more interested in reading and it helps them to understand how to read and what to read and, um, and they can start to ask questions. Um, um, other strategies, um, a good preschool program, um, um, preparing children for reading and preparing children for um, those kinds of things. A child doesn't have to go to preschool, <clears throat> but um, you know, but, you know, in many cases, um, preschool is very helpful for children. It helps them, <coughs> excuse me, with socialization skills um, and just you know, learning things that educated, um, you know, preschool teachers um, can can help them with. Um, and then enhancing children's language, um, you know, when they're making mistakes, when they're over-regularizing, for example, um, uh, what parents typically do or people around them is um, they, they repeat what the child says, they extend it, um, so they add more information, but they also correct it. So if a child says, I go to the store, you say, oh, you went to the store. What did you do at the store? And so that, conversational, that um, conversation helps them to expand their vocabulary and also correct things. So. Um, so, um, and then chapter six, um, protective optimism. Um, children are, are wildly optimistic about what their capabilities are. And so if you ask them, like, you know, can you run a mile? Yes, absolutely. You know, can you, you know, jump over that fence? Yes, I think I can. Um, they can do all, they think that they can do all kinds of things. So that's the optimistic start part. Um, it's protective because if you had children who were self-handicapping saying, no, nope, don't think I'm ever gonna be much of a reader, not gonna try that. Um, then they won't try it and they won't ever succeed. Or I don't think I'm gonna be much of a runner or soccer player, whatever it is, uh, and they don't try it. If you don't try it, you'll never get any better at it and so you definitely won't succeed. Um, and so that protective optimism gets them to try a whole array of things, some of which they will develop skills for, some of which they will learn that they have some limitations about, um, but it helps them to just try everything um, uh, early in life um, so that they can understand um, what things are like um, and get more information about things and, and understand what they like um, and do more of the things that they like um, and get better at those things. Um, um, this chapter um, talks about um, parenting styles and also play styles. 
Um, and I've had students ask me, do I have to know names on the test? Um, I usually, um, when there's a famous name that's always associated with something, I use the name and the theory together. So if I talk about Bomberin's parenting styles, it's not because there's another theorist who has parenting styles that's also going to be on the test. Um, so the question isn't, is it Bomberin or not? The question is, it is Bomberin and it is um, uh, parenting styles which parenting style is the appropriate one. So um, don't be put off by, uh, by names being thrown in there. You know, I think it, it helps you, you know, sort of like with, you know, when, with children when you're enhancing their language by adding things. You know, I think the, to the extent that my, um, my mentors have added those names in as they talked about things, it helped me internalize it um, so that I can understand it and talk about it better. And I want to pass that on to you as well. Um, so um, play styles, review the play styles, review the parenting styles and the differences between those. Um, and then pro-social and uh, sort of antisocial, but not you know antisocial in the sense of a disorder. Um, pro-social behavior is behavior that is altruistic in some way. It's um, intended to help someone other, some some other person, without any benefit to yourself. Um, and then uh, on aggression, um, the two forms of aggression that I really focus on in this class are instrumental aggression and hostile aggression. Um, instrumental aggression being um, sometimes children uh, are. Uh, are, are rough with other kids and they uh, display aggression because that child is in their way and they want to get to something else. If you're in my way and I want to get the soccer ball and I push you down, I'm not pushing you down because I don't like you, you're just in my way. And it's a form of aggression, um, but it wasn't directed at you per se. Um, hostile aggression, though, is directed at that person. So what we find is physical aggression declines um, throughout childhood, and by the time you get to you know college, um, you don't like walk around like shoving people in the hallway anymore. Um, but little kids do. Um, so um, so those forms of aggression, uh, I think, are important to be aware of, so that um, if you see aggression, you can think about well, was that child really trying to hurt the, the child? I mean, they did hurt the child. The other child is crying. Um, was it intended to hurt that child and then you deal with it in one way or was it instrumental aggression and then you need to teach the child that did it, hey, when people are in your way, that's not how we get around them. So, okay. Um, so that's it for chapters four, five, and six. I um, hope it's helpful um, and stay tuned for the other videos. Thanks. Bye.